New Jersey on. And um, so years ago, um, I would get grants so that I could go into the schools and do monarch programs in the schools and tagging programs as well. And um, every time I went to a school, I had what I call uh, monarch magnet plants that I would give the schools so that they could start a schoolyard habitat. Um, so that's how... I kind of all got started. My grandmother was a big monarch fan too. I don't think she ever realized what was going on with them. She just loved them because they were big butterflies and they were beautiful. So we call her grandma and butterfly. So um, I've got a uh, PowerPoint that'll take you through some of the stuff we're gonna be talking about their migration. And then at the end, as Caitlin said, um, I've got a monarch right here that we're gonna tag. So um, let me switch over. I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Do you see it? Yes, looks great. Good, here we go. All right, so... Um, you know, the, earlier this year, you may have seen some monarchs go through. Like, I think my earliest monarch sighting has been like in um, April. Um, and then definitely through June and July, um, start seeing some eggs, start seeing some caterpillars. Um, but it's this time of year that it, things really get interesting. Because this is the top, the season of uh, migration, all right. And to understand what's going on, um, migration, the the understanding of what migration is is important. So this is the technical uh, definition of migration. Uh, the key thing right here is that species are moving, organisms are moving from one place to the next to take advantage of uh, better breeding conditions or better feeding conditions in other areas. Um, if they stay in one area, there's a chance where um, there could be some overcrowding. With overcrowding, there's a more, better chance for diseases to, to spread um, and more competition for food. So species will migrate to go to places where there's not so much of a concentration. Um, the monarch has the longest migration of in North America of any insects. So there's other insects that go further, but not here in North America. Um, and the monarchs can go anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 miles in their migration. But to understand that, you need to understand the life cycle. So I know you might be thinking, well, I learned about the life cycle in kindergarten. Well, yep, maybe you did. Um, I'm gonna go over it just so that you know it in a little bit more detail. If you've seen this in your garden, two butterflies back to back, please advert your eyes. These are monarchs mating, all right? And so the male has appendages on the end of his abdomen where he craft clasps uh, on to the female and then um, in inserts his, um, his uh, sperm into her and she has eggs. The next thing is the egg is laid. So she, they lay about 700 eggs. And this is obviously a, a, a large picture of one, um, but to give you some size, if you think about the lowercase i in newsprint, just organized, ordinary newsprint, the egg is like the size of the dot above that lowercase i. The caterpillar that comes out is like the line under it, all right? So that gives you a little bit of a size thing. So they're in this egg for about seven to 10 days. And um, after that, they emerge. Again, very, very small. Um, 
little caterpillar and the very first thing they do is they eat their eggshell and then they start eating the milkweed or the host plant. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, they're going to get so big that they can't get any bigger and they will shed off their skin. Then they'll eat that skin and then go back to eating the milkweed. And that'll happen again and again. So there's five instar stages. When they get up to the last instar stage, they're about the size of your pinky. All right. And so for that little tiny caterpillar to go to that big, the size of your pinky in two weeks. All right. And so let's put that in human terms. If a human baby grew as fast as a caterpillar did and as big as a caterpillar got, that human baby would be the size of a school bus in two weeks. All right. So that's a huge amount of growth, but that's what the caterpillar's job is. It's to eat and to grow and eat and grow. All right. And so once they get up to that last instar stage, they find a horizontal space. It could be a branch in the garden. They come off of their host plant. They find a branch in the garden, or it could be any horizontal place. It could be your windowsill. It could be the edge of the clapboard um, outside of your house. I've seen them... Um, about a, up to a hundred feet away from their host plant. So those little caterpillars will just take off until they find that, that nice underside. And the caterpillar is gonna um, spin a little silk button. And if you look at the top of the chrysalis where it's connected with that branch, you'll see that little white dot. And that's a, um, just a little silk button. And they're gonna hang on that silk button with their hind legs. And then they will, their skin will split. It'll, they'll wiggle around. The skin will come up to the top. And the very last thing that will come out is this thing called a cream master. And a cream master just looks, looks like a little stick, but at the end of it, it has hooks just like Velcro, and they'll jam that cream master up into that silk button. And they'll wiggle around to make sure those hooks get tangled in the silk. And then they will hang like, well, and then they'll hang like that. And um, they become the chrysalis as that skin comes off, all right? They'll be like that for another two weeks. And then, something really cool starts to happen. The chrysalis will actually turn uh, black about 24 hours before they get ready to come out. Um, and if you look carefully at the chrysalis, you can see the pattern, the orange pattern of the wing inside. When that chrysalis splits, the first thing out is their head and their legs. And they reach up and grab hold of the chrysalis. And then their abdomen falls out. Their abdomen is very, very full. Their wings are very tiny and very wrinkled. Their proboscis, their mouth parts, are in two separate pieces and they'll kind of like zip them together into a tube. And they will start to pump their abdomen. Now their abdomen is filled with fluid. And when they pump it, um, it Go, the fluid goes into their wings. They hang upside down, so gravity can help that a little bit. And the wings will um, unfold out, get very stiff for butterfly wings, and they'll hang there. Now, this whole process is usually in the morning, so that by noontime, their wings are um, all inflated with that that liquid, they're all dry, and the butterflies are ready to move. Okay, so that's the life cycle. And so depending on when that happens, we'll determine what happens next. So this time of year, the monarchs that we have from Southern Canada 
um, and east of the Rocky Mountains are all migrating down to the transvolcanic uh, mountain range in Mexico. Um, and there are sanctuaries up in the mountains that are just northwest of uh, Mexico City, about 100 miles northwest. The monarchs that are on the east coast of the or the west coast, I'm sorry, of the Rocky Mountains all go to um, anywhere from middle of California, like around Santa Cruz, um, all the way down the coast and into the Baja of California, um, Mexico. And so there, and, and there's some data showing that there may be some crossover from east to west down when they get down into Mexico. Um, they spend the entire winter down there. So this generation that's going down will just go straight on down and they will spend the winter. They will, um, these are not leaves on the trees that you see. These are all monarchs. Um, they are going to the fir trees that are on the mountains and they're just covering the entire tree, the trunk, um, the branches. It's just incredible. And they do that because it, there's warmth in that. All right. They're all huddled up in there. Um, the mountains of Mexico, they can get down into like the 40s. And that's fine. Um, it's when sometimes they'll have like a like a, a a freeze. You know how we get all of a sudden we'll get a storm come through or something. They get them down in Mexico too. But as long as they're all clumped together like that, most of them are able to survive that. And so they spend the entire winter there, down there. The te technically. Um, they should be down there by the end of October um, into early November and then um, stay there until the end of February. The end of February, they start getting a little on the active side. Um, you will have them like early in the morning. They'll be all tightly uh, clustered on those trees. And then with the afternoon sun, um, they'll get up, they'll come down out of the trees, they will go to the dew that is in the lawns or on other plants and, and drink that, um, that water. Um, but it, this is all related to photo period. And photo period is the daylight length. So if the daylight length is getting longer, there's changes that happen. Um, there's hormones that are changing. Um, and it's giving the, the monarchs the urge to migrate again. And so they're gonna come up in stages. They're gonna come up into Texas. Um, the monarchs, they're coming up out of Mexico. They're coming into Texas, Louisiana. Um, they will mate, lay eggs and die, all right? Then those eggs, will go through their life cycle, become butterflies and migrate up a little bit more. They'll mate, lay eggs, die. Those eggs will again, go through that process. And so it takes about three or four generations for them to get up into Northern Canada, or I'm sorry, Southern Canada. So why don't they go any further? Because they've been following the milkweed as it emerges all the way up. So the milkweed is just ahead of them so that by the time those butterflies get there, they can lay eggs on that milkweed, all right? And so all along that migration, that's that northerly migration, as well as their southerly migration this time of year, the number one thing that they need is habitat. So they need, it, it's the key for any species that migrates, all right? They need to find a place where they can get food, where they can get rest, where they can drink, 
These are the top things. And in the case of these northern moving monarchs in the spring and summer, they need um, places to lay their eggs too. So um, again, food, very important. All right, if you like to travel, you like to stop to get something to eat, they need food too. So at this time of year, um, the monarchs are in great need of these plants. So number one is seaside goldenrod and it is in bloom right now. And one of, one of the biggest things with goldenrod is people um, mistakenly think that they're allergic to it. You're not allergic to it. You have to go out and put repose right in it. Um, it's got a tactile pollen, which means insects have to go to it to move that pollen around to pollinate that plant. All right. Um, what's getting you now is the ragweed. Ragweed has a green flower. Nobody sees it. Um, so lots of goldenrod out there. Um, New England aster is another important plant. Uh, cone flowers. And then that last one is... Uh, a mist flower, all right? And they're in bloom right now as well. That's where they're getting their nectar from. Um, they also need water. So that comes in the form of puddles and dew. The other thing they need is shelter, which are the trees and shrubs. And most often they're not going to the deciduous trees. Uh, the deciduous tree, they, they can, um, but the deciduous trees are losing their leaves. So the monarchs are uh, more interested in the evergreens, the pines that we have, the cedars, and that's where they'll roost for the night. Um, in the spring, in that migration, they're looking for a suitable place to raise the young. And if you want monarchs, you got to have milkweed. Um, the monarchs will, they know the difference, all right? They taste with their feet. And if you watch them, they'll go down and they will land on a leaf, kind of like do a little dance. And then if they go off, then that might be not the plant that they need. Um, once they find the milkweed, the female will, just like you see in this picture, she'll dip her ab abdomen under the leaf and lay one tiny egg. All right. Um, every butterfly species and every moth species has what's called their host plant. And their host plant is the plant on which they will lay their eggs. They will not lay their eggs on just any old plant. So every moth species and every butterfly species has their own host plant or host plant family. So if you say, oh, well, I saw a monarch caterpillar on my parsley. No, that wasn't a monarch. That was the black swallowtail. All right, they look very similar. The caterpillars look very similar. Um, so there are about, there are over a hundred milkweeds in the United States. There's 12 milkweeds in New Jersey. And the three most common are these three right here. The bigger one um, is the common milkweed. Um, the pink one is the swamp milkweed. And then the orange one um, is butterflyweed. All right. And so those are the most common. Um, so how do we know that monarchs go to Mexico? Well, we tag them, all right. And this is a uh, tag from Monarch Watch. Um, it's got all the information that is needed to get that tag information back to Monarch Watch. It's got a website. It's got a um, phone number. I don't. I, the new tags do not have a phone number. Uh, they just have a website. They have Monarch Watch, and they have um, a letter number code, which is unique for each tag. So um, tagging has been going on since 1937. Uh, Dr. Fred Uhart and his uh, wife, Nora, began tagging them uh, back in 
Dr. Fred was a, um, an entomologist up in Canada. He loved his butterflies. He was wondering where they went in the winter. Um, and so he started tagging. And it wasn't until 1975 that um, Catalina Trail, who was a student, I believe, of uh, Dr. Fred's, uh, found the monarch colonies down in Mexico. And the following year, he went down and um, saw them for the first time. Um, in more contemporary uh, monarch um, researchers, Lincoln Brower, who um, he passed not too long ago, um, he spearheaded um, a lot of research going on with monarchs that people are continuing today. Chip Taylor, uh, founder and director of Monarch Watch, is still um, out there going strong. We look to him um, when we want to know what's been going on down in Mexico. He sends out a report um, to tell us about what the, the estimated population is down there. And um, so if you want to get onto some of that information, definitely go to monarchwatch.org. They have a lot of studies that are going on and also an update. Um, that's where our tags are going and that's where we go to, to find out if our tag has been found. Um, a little bit closer to home is the Monarch Monitoring Project. And that was started by New Jersey Audubon back in the 1990s. Um, and today um, it continues. Um, they still do a road census, which is a very short drive um, that they, they take three times a day in the morning, in the afternoon, and around three o'clock um, in the after afternoon. Um, and the driver of the car is driving, I think like 25, 30 miles on this loop and the driver's taking account of the butterflies. And that may sound very, very simple and it is, but when science is done consistently, you get a lot of good data coming out of it. And we are able, when we hear that uh, mark populations in general, which is taking up um, considering all the monarch populations from east of the Rocky Mountains all the way across the United States um, and compare the data that we're seeing here just in Cape May, um, we see a little bit of a difference. And we point to the fact that the monarchs that we're seeing coming through Cape May are coming probably from like New England. And New England is a very affluent area, very well-educated area, um, and people have been having uh, gardens and native plants for a long time. And we feel that that has helped that the population that we have right here along the coast versus inland uh, in the middle of the United States where you have the big factory farms that have taken over a lot of the prairie. There's just not a lot of habitat for the monarchs anymore. And so that's been a big push of Monarch Watches to get people out in the Midwest to get those gardens going. Um, so we also have tagging uh, demonstrations that are done down in Cape May uh, during the week. Um, and where it says over the wing tag, that's what we used to use. Um, now we use Monarch tags, Monarch Watch tags. And so uh, not too long ago in 2015, uh, the Monarch Ambassadors were formed and the Monarch Ambassadors were um, part of a grant that came out of the Monarch Monitoring Project. And what the goal was um, with that was, we know that the Monarchs will go into roost in great numbers down in Cape May. We know that they also roost in great numbers in Stone Harbor and in um, East Point over on the Delaware Bay side. And so the question is, are these two more northern roosts, are those monarchs, when they come out of roost in the morning, are they traveling down to Cape May? 
and then going over the Delaware Bay to Delaware? Or are those roof sites going from Stone Harbor and East Point directly over to Delaware? And so um, with this grant, um, we tag with colored tax, same tax that they do down in Cape May. It's just that in Stone Harbor, we tag with green tags and East Point tags with blue tags um, in hope that somebody in Cape May sees the tags or maybe they don't see the tags to kind of give us some idea of where these monarchs are going. Um, and the other uh, part of the monarch ambassadors is to do public education. Um, for the most part, it's a passive education where people will see us out there tagging. They come up, they ask questions, and we tell them what's going on. Um, last year and this year, I'm doing um, a tagging demonstration at 3.30 on Wednesdays down at the Wetlands Institute. Um, and that's about an hour long and people get all of the, the nitty gritty with what's going on with the monarchs. So, um, we know where they go in the winter. All right. So why do we need to keep tagging them if we know where they go? And the answer to that is we need to be able to connect the habitats. All right. And so... If we know, <coughs> excuse me, if we know what routes they're taking, maybe we can protect those routes a little bit better. So that's the whole idea. Um, and why monarchs? What about the other animals out there that are migrating? The other uh, butterflies that are migrating? Um, many my, many uh, butterflies will overwinter here as egg, as caterpillar, as chrysalis. There's a couple that'll do it as butterfly. So like the morning cloak and the, the red admiral will overwinter as butterflies here. But the rest have to be in another uh, stage of their development because the, the food just isn't here. There's no nectar source for them and so they just need to to chill literally to get through the winter monarchs are tropical monarchs um so they have to get out of here they have to uh migrate there are other uh butterflies that also migrate so uh monarchs are kind of like the the poster child of not only other butterflies that are migrating but other pollinators that are uh doing their thing and so it's all to make the connections between monarchs and the other pollinators, right? Um, and this is a really good poster of all different kinds of pollinators out there, anywhere from bees to butterflies to moths. Um, mammals are out there, the bats. They all need to get to have habitat. Okay, and to have native plants as habitat. And that's the whole key to this. Um, again, monarchs are just the poster child that speak for all of these pollinators. And so what kinds of things can you do? You can keep asking questions, um, keep asking questions to learn more, keep asking questions to your um, local uh Government, what are they doing? Um, are they putting uh, native plants in when they do their uh, new land acquisitions? Or are they getting rid of the invasives? Keep on top, you know, um, that's important. The other thing is for you to do in your own backyard is create a backyard habitat. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of resources for that. Um, the Homegrown National Park is a premise coming out of Doug Ptolemy's uh, book where he feels that if everybody took at least part of their yard and turned it into a native area, um, we would have the size of a pretty good national park um, if 
people just turned it into native land again. And we're not talking like your entire land, even if you do just a little bit at a time, that's going to be much better than um, trying to take tackle a whole yard. Um, note your sightings. If you see monarchs or if you see your milkweed coming up, um, go to Journey North. They have interactive maps where you can see the progression of milkweed. You can see the progression of monarchs. You can see the progression of other species. Um, I can't say enough about Journey North. You need to get on that website and just check it out. It's awesome. And then spread the word. Um, when you get your habitat put in, get it certified. Um, this is a way for your neighbors or people going by to see your yard, see what's going on in your yard and know why it's going on. And that's so critical. Uh, sometimes they'll go by and I just had somebody the other day say to me, um, oh, the, the, this garden is so weedy and this, and it's like, it's got native plants and native plants are dying back this time of year and it's okay. And they said, well, there's all these flowers over there. And I said, well, they're, they're not native flowers and they're just taking up space right now because there's nothing that's going to them. And so I had my hands filled trying to convince her, but I will get her. <laughs> So um, let's tag a monarch. Um, here is the up close field data sheet that I'm going to use, um, but I'll have it right down here so you can see me filling it out. So I'm going to stop this and go over to my other camera. We're going to see how this works. Uh, here we go. All right, do you see that? Yes, we see the camera now. Okay, I'm gonna bring, bring it up a little bit and switch it over to my other thing if I can. No, we'll just leave it there. All right, so here I've got my tags, I've got my data sheet, pencil, all that other good stuff. Um, I'll bring this up a little bit closer, maybe you can see it, that's eh, a little, Blurry, sorry about that. Um, but these are the tags that I'm gonna use. It comes in a sheet of 25. We've already used some of them. Um, and so we'll just get to it. Um, let me put this stuff over here. I've got my ruler. I'll pull this out a little bit. All right. And so we'll get the monarch out. So this monarch was um, caught yesterday. Right there, little critter. And um, very good specimen in very good health. Um, and so the very first thing we're gonna put is we're going to put our glasses on. Um, we're going to put the tag code. So the tag code is AAZT. And then the number is 875. All right. The date is 1012. The time is 1. 14 p.m. And the very first thing we're going to need to know is, is it a male or female? And so to do that, you've got to open it up and we look at the hind wings, all right? And so the, on the male, the hind wings have a black dot here and here. Those are scent glands. When I teach kindergartners, I say that's where they put their aftershave. So they'll be attractive to females. A female, let me show you, I have some wings here. So this one, I'll put it down. This one has the dots here and here. All right. And then right next to it is the female. Let me get it on the right side. All right. 
The female has thicker veins in the wings, but no black dots. Okay. So that's how you tell male from female. And so we'll put our little M up there for male. And um, the R and W means, was it raised from an egg or a caterpillar? Or was it caught in the wild? And this one was caught in the wild. So we'll just put W for that. Now, something that um, you can go and, and you can actually purchase um, tags from Monarch Watch and tag your own butterflies. They come with instructions of what to do and everything. And in those instructions, you're not going to see um, four wing length or fat assessment. These things um, we take for the Monarch Monitoring Project in Cape May. And so to do the four wing, the four wing are these two large wings. I just hold the butterfly like that. And we're working with centimeters. The um, zero of the the uh, ruler goes right at the base of the wing. And then I'm seeing that this one is 52 centimeters, or I'm sorry, 52 millimeters, centimeters, oh my goodness. Put that there. And then we do a fat assessment, which is where um, I take the abdomen, all right, and I put it between my three fingers. So it's like I'm taking it like this with my three fingers. Okay. I just give it a little squeeze, not a lot, just enough to feel what the abdomen feels like. Does it have a lot? Of, has it been eating a lot, drinking a lot? Um, I'm going to give this guy a two. He's pretty hungry. So that's probably what he'll go for as soon as I put him out. Um, the scale is from one to four. So one meaning they got to get out there now. Um, four meaning <laughs> they're pretty firm and they're ready to go. All right. Then location. I'm going to put uh, TWI, which means the Wetlands Institute, because that's where um, it came from. And that's where I'm going to release it to. And Right now I'm in my house and I'm about, I don't know, about three or four miles away from there. And so I don't want to release it here. Seven miles, I'm sorry. And then observations would just be that um, healthy wings. All right. And then we got to tag it. So to tag it, I take the wing, the hind wing, and what I'm doing is I'm rubbing off some of the scales, all right? They're right there on my thumb, all right? Um, let me see. I'm gonna move this over. Here's a little bit darker area. Maybe you can see the, the scales. Can you see the scales right there? If you look at, um, a butterfly's wing under a microscope, it looks sort of like um, a tiled roof um, with the scales all hanging down. All right, so I take those off. And why do I take those off? Well, have you ever tried putting uh, tape on a dusty surface? Tape's not gonna stay so well. I just take the um, tag, my finger, just put it right down there where I took the scales off and just give it a press. The heat of my hand will help activate that, um, the adhesive. And then this little guy is ready to go. All right, that's about it. All right. Kind of cool. That's awesome, Sue. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Let me stop sharing here.
Okay. All right. I think so now would be a good time. If anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat or raise your hand, take yourself off mute. Uh, the raise your hand function is in the reactions. Um, if you want to come off mute and ask a question. That camera, by the way, worked out great. That was so cool to see the monarch tagging up close. Yeah, that's a great little fun thing to have. Here we go, look. Oh, there he is. He's ready to go. Oh, Paul, looks like you have a question. Oh, you're on mute. Can you hear me? I, I'm good. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned that Journey North website. I just typed that in into the App Store and it doesn't come up. Is that the exact name? Yeah, that's what I put in, Journey North. Put in Journey North Migration. It might take you to one of their pages. Okay, I'll find it. I'll play around with it for a while. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead. I understand the spring they uh, birth, uh, rebirth, coming back up um, from Mexico to the north. But are you saying that one single butterfly goes from Canada to Mexico? Yep. Yes. Yes. So the ones that are coming up in the spring, they're only living for about a month. Uh -huh. Okay. So from egg to adult. They lay their, they'll migrate up a little bit, lay their eggs and die, okay? This generation that we have now coming through, the migrating generation, they will fly all the way from here, 2000 plus miles down to Mexico. Wow. And they will stay there until, I would say like when I was down in Mexico, I was down at the end of February, and um, they were a little on the, you could feel that tension, you know, like we got, something's going on, something's got to change. As a matter of fact, um, I went down to, Mex to Mexico in 2018 and we were there like that last week in February. And um, when we came home, we got um, notification that they were all, all, all millions of them were gone next week they had taken off so we just made it um yeah we would have gone down there and just seen trees you know but, um yeah so they just get that urge and and the conditions are right and boom they're gone they're coming up wow yeah and they and they get to like texas or louisiana as i said and now we saw some mating down there and we're like, oh, no, not now. Don't do it yet. Because we're pretty far down in Mexico when that happens. Oh. So, um, but, you know, tell them not to me. Not sure. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Sue? Yeah. It's Tr Trudy Smith. Does the tagging interfere with their flying at all? Does it slow them down or no? No, not at all. Okay. And so how do we know that? Because yeah. we've had um, just just the Monarch Monitoring Project from Cape May, we've had over 200 found down in Mexico. Oh, okay. Now, we've been tagging since the 1990s. And every year we tag a couple thousand of them. And you may think, well, a couple thousand since, you know, for like, 20 some odd years and you're only finding 200. Well, yeah, you try to find those tags down there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just astonishing how many are all in that area. And, Thanks. Uh, when, when the tags are found, they're found by the guides that are guiding people up to the uh, sanctuaries. Um, and then it used to be that the guides would sell the tags for like $5 a tag to one of the tourists or to the tourists. And then it was up to the tourist to turn to tell you 
to turn around and get that mm -hmm. data to Monarch Watch. Um, mm -hmm. I know, I don't know whether they still do that. I wasn't, um, I was focused on the Monarchs. I wasn't focused on who had tags mm -hmm. or what. Um, but I do know that Monarch Watch has people down there that the guides can contact and Monarch Watch will pay them for those tax. It's a very, very impoverished area. And so they, mm. uh, the forests where the monarchs are uh, overwintering, it was very important to the people down there. Uh, they used that wood for heat. They used mm. it for cooking. And now they're saying, no, you can't do that because the monarchs are there. And so they have to make a living somehow. So the tagging is one, or um, the collection of the tags. And it's illegal for them to say, look, I see a tag on a mo live monarch up there. I've got to grab that. They cannot do that. It's got to be a dead mo monarch that fell to the ground. No. Hmm. Yeah. So. And you said they only live like for one cycle, right? Yep. Yep. Now, I, I actually had a monarch um, in 2005 that I, um, I raised from egg or caterpillar, I can't remember which, um, tagged it at the Wetlands Institute in Stone Harbor. And that winter, it was found in El Rosario, Mexico, which is one of the biggest um, butterfly sanctuaries down there. Wow. That was cool. Very interesting, Sue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trudy. So I just want to let, um, I know Bob was asking about the Journey North website. I think I found it. I'd put it in the chat, um, journeynorth.org slash monarchs. Um, let me know, Sue, if that sounds right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I actually had a question about um, the different generations of monarchs, it seems like the one that goes, you know, the one that is traveling now down in Mexico and then overwinters in Mexico lives so much longer than the other generations. Is there like, is it coded genetically different or is it just like, that's, it just, we don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. Wow. Um, the only thing that we can point to is um, the, Photo period is one thing. Again, it the daylight length turns on and turns off hormones. And so in, and that is across the board, no matter what living organism you talk about, even us, okay? Um, and so that daylight length will do a couple things. One, it's the urge to migrate, but it also, has them going into what's called sexual diapause. So, you know, menopause is the complete stopping of the production of gametes, egg, sperm. Diapause is just the pausing of it. And so they won't be laying any eggs mm. um, on their migration down there. Mm. Okay. So, and, and then when they, in the spring, when the daylight length starts to lengthen, they'll come out of diapause and lay their eggs then. Gotcha. So it has maybe something to do with why that one generation can live a little bit longer than some of the other ones. Okay. Interesting. And, and the other the, oh. milkweed's dying back. If you looked at the milkweed lately, it looks awful. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to seed, the leaves are getting yellow and falling off so there's not really places for them to lay their eggs yeah and, and, but let me take a step back two things one um you may still get eggs and caterpillars those eggs and caterpillars won't make it mm. okay two people have started bringing up tropical milkweed from florida and hmm. it will it can survive an entire mild winter the problem with that is is that um it, it's it is 
you know, why should they go anywhere? Because they have something. Um, and it, it's also a, car a carrier of a disease that monarchs are spreading. Um, it's called OE, which are, is the uh, initials of the disease organism. And so you don't want something that's going to overwinter, like especially a disease that they mm -hmm. can then pass on to the next generation. Yeah. Wow. Something to think about. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I did get that site by typing into their website, not using the app store. Thank you. Oh, okay. Gotcha. No yeah, look, look around on that site. It's an awesome site. And it's geared towards people of all age levels. They have um, lessons uh, for school kids and or homeschool kids. And um, it's really fascinating information all the way up. It doesn't matter how old you are. <laughs> That's pretty old. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat. I think we're all set for today. Um, Sue, I wanted to thank you for your time today and showing us all about monarchs and monarch tagging. So we're going to give you a online round of applause. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, and we will certainly take a look at all those resources that you sent. Um, it's really fascinating how this little uh, insect can um, do so much. It's really incredible. So yeah. um, thank you for sharing and we'll let you continue with the monarch tagging. It's monarch tagging season. So I know you've got somewhere to be uh, this afternoon, but um, thank you again so much. And thank you everybody who attended today. Um, we're going Thanks to put a me. copy. Oh yeah, of course, Sue, no problem. Anytime. Yeah, good, great. Um, so thank you, thank you again. And, uh, oh, Paul, did you want to say anything? I'm sorry. No, I just said thank you. Thank you, Paul. Great. Well, enjoy the rest of the day, everybody. And we'll uh, hopefully see you at the next Lunch and Learn. So take care. Thanks.